Uh, hi everyone, today we will tell you about the black box attack, why it was dead and why it is alive now. We will tell you about our ATM research uh, related to the cash dispenser uh, that is one of the main ATM parts. Also we will describe its work, its hardware security, how to get the money from an ATM and how successful attacks can be performed. So let us introduce ourselves. So, who we are? My name is Vladimir, I am a reverse engineer and it, it is also my hobby. Uh, I started reversing in 2008 and uh, now I work in positive technologies research team. Uh, when I started it, uh, were many crack mis, kagan mis and so on. And uh, also I am an active uh, Sega Mega Drive uh, Genesis from hacking community member. Uh, I help others in modifying uh, TV, old school TV games. Uh, it's about recompressing resources, graphics, text and so on. And also I'll help, I help others in uh, translating uh, games into different languages. Alexei. Hello, my name is Alexei. My previous job and my hobby were hardware engineering and embedded soft software development, including industrial control systems. I'm also interested in hardware and software reverse engineering. Now I'm working in positive technologies, industrial control systems, security research team, and perform some work on our ATM projects. So what is the ATM area? Actually, it's a very closed area and it's difficult to get into it. It happens because the vendor's main idea is to make security through obscurity. Actually, you can find any SDK software samples and also ATM software and firmware in public. But any real ATM is always the same as you can see in the picture. It's also hard to take an ATM for research. What you can find inside an ATM? First of all, it's divided into two main areas, the upper cabinet and the safe. When the cabinet is opened, you will get into the service area. The following ATM parts located here, PC, monitor, encrypting, pin pad, printers, and other devices. All the OS devices are connected to the PC are just like usual peripherals. Usually, logical attacks can be done through this zone because most of the locks in the cabinet are primitive. The most interesting device is dispenser. Its purpose is to store and issue cash. Therefore, it stays in the safe. The only things of dispenser can be accessed from the service area are power wires and data bus, which are connected to a PC. Let's look at the data flow of an, of an ATM. It's not complex. External communication of an ATM is communication with processing center. The processing center communication is realized using VPN, TLS, MAC, and it's secure in most cases. The next level of communication is Windows-based application. It communicates with XFS services layer by an API. It's middleware which implements a unified device access. Service provider is a bottom layer solution for interaction with device drivers. The lowest level of communication is a data transmission over hardware buses to devices. We are interested, interested exactly in this issue. Some people want to take money from an ATM because it's just a box of metal and plastic. The main ATM security threats are fraud, brute force attacks, malware, and hardware attacks. ATM crime actions can be divided according to the method of access into two main parts, physical attacks and logical attacks. Let's look at each of them. Physical attacks can be fraud-based or brute force. As you could hear from the news, this kind of attack is widely used, most popular, and happens everywhere in the world every day. It uses trivial techniques like schemers of different complexity, trappers that hold card inside an ATM, cameras, and some transaction reversal techniques. Another type of physical attacks is brute force attacks. An example, an intruder can blow explosive gas into the safe and then detonate it so the safe door will be turned out and stored cash will be scattered on the floor. Another example is, an example is resting an entire ATM from a wall by a truck. The results you can see on the pictures. Now let's look at logical attacks. That, the most common type is malware-based attack. There are many examples of ATM targeted malware, but they all use XFS services layer to interact with hardware parts. 
basically with dispenser and pin pad. If you are interested in ATM security, you may hear of the Cutlet Make, a Plotus Green Dispenser, and other malware. There are a few distribution ways of such malware, remotely from ATM processing center or locally from USB device, for example. And now let's look at another type of logical attacks that called black box. It's one of the most complex and te technically difficult attack. And it also has many specifics. Black box attacks are the attacks with usage of some extra hardware devices connected to hardware buses. This device is called black boxes. You can see an example of such devices in, in the photo. To the casual observer, it looks like opening service area, connecting some device or laptop to the dispenser bus and cash withdrawal. Thus, this type of attack requires good knowledge of low-level protocols and ATM hardware. Such attacks do not depend on processing center, operating system, and ATM software. Let's try to figure out how to connect a dispenser to the PC. Generally, it's connected by RS-232, SDC, or USB interfaces. Also, in some sources, there are references to CAN bus usage, but we haven't seen it alive. Let's take a more detailed look at these devices. The first and oldest interface is RS-232, as well as the COM port. The specificity of this connection is usage of multiplexer to expand the number of ports, as they are usually not enough in PC. An example of multiplexer is in the photo. You only need a laptop and cheap USB to COM adapter to perform this attack. Usually data is transmitted in an unprotected way, and firmware encryption patches are very limited in their resources. In a number of cases, the commands are human-readable, and it's enough to look into the traffic in order to understand and reproduce them. This is too primitive, and so let's move to the next interface. This is the SDC bus. It's proprietary for NCR ATMs. In fact, is it is RS-485, is a multi-drop COM port. Vendor uses unusual bitrate and byte size here. An encryption is trivial XOR operation. The interaction is built of principle on master several slaves, and the slave devices are connected to the same wires on the bus in parallel. A popular attack is called drill box. An attacker cuts a hole in the ATM fascia next to the pin pad. Then attacker turns off pin pad, turns on his device, and connect, connect to the SDC bus, which also goes to the safe to, for the dispenser. Further, you only need to send the data protocol sequences for cache action issue. Usually, special interface cut is installed into PC for communication via SDC. And finally, what most interesting and complex logical bus is USB. First of all, you need to understand a lot of terminology and abstractions, for example, in points, descriptors, interfaces, and their types. Typically, dispensers are identified as human interface devices or composite devices. However, to see the data at low level, you need a hardware sniffer. Obsolete USB dispensers usually have inherited protocols from COM port devices with the same drawbacks, but we will not consider them. Let's look at examples of real attacks on more sophisticated USB dispensers. In 2014, one of the findings of Positive Technologies research team in devices of this type was incorrect initialization of random function, so the initial key was predictable. In this regard, the currently implemented encrypted protocol appeared to be vulnerable. This error allowed to iterate the session encryption key for a finite time, and then to send command to cache issue, cache issue. This vulnerability was exploited in real attacks and has been already fixed by the vendor. The most recent attack is related to attack of this type was made in 2017. And the scope was used in addition to the laptop with some engineering software. And then laptop was connected to dispenser. And the scope was let down into the safe of the hole after the shutter was broken. Then the scope switched the sensor simulating engineer's application during the dispenser maintenance. After that, the firmware cache issue test function was unlocked and it was used by attacker. At this point, you could have seemed the black box attack are things of the past and the diet as a class. Since the last attack may be classified as a physical attack, the, and the vendors have implemented encryption everywhere. However, we proceed to our case. So to research an ATM hardware, we need to determine 
the manufacturer and its hardware. In our case, the choice was quite simple. Since NCR is one of the largest manufacturers of ATM and software for them. It's also very common on our LIV projects. New ATMs considered one of the most secure and communication with dispenser is encrypted. So our choice is NCR S1 dispenser. Usually cache dispenser is a very complex device. Mechanics of dispenser performs cache storing, picking, validation and transportation. Every movement is performed by drive units and controlled by sensors. The brain of cache dispenser is its control electronics. It's usually called dispenser controller. All mechanical parts of dispenser have their specific names. The dispensers are built with two, three or four peak modules placed below the presenter model. Bills are stored in cassettes. Also, the dispenser have a dedicated rigid cassette for jammed or wrong peak banknotes. Bills are transported from the peak mechanism to bill validator data and then to presenter. In case no errors has have occurred, banknotes are issued through the shutter. And dispenser controller is a control board that controls the operation of currency dispenser. It's called fire processor based board responsible for collecting all sensor information and operation the mechanics and also communicating commands and sending responses to the ATM. The control board is mixed technology PCB employing both surface mount technology and plated through the whole components. So. Uh, you want to protect the future, you want to find and report some vulnerabilities to NCR, but uh, you don't have an ATM and uh, you also have, don't have a firmware binary. Uh, what you can do? Uh, well, unfortunately for the vendor, unfortunately for you, it is possible because uh, you can buy a controller bot at eBay, for example. Uh, why, it, why it happens? Because uh, when the dispenser becomes broken, uh, the service center usually replaces the whole device and uh, parts of the dispenser may be a cell uh, by parts. So uh, after you have bought the dispenser controller, you need to get its firmware. It, it is much harder, uh, but you can ask uh, your friend that works in the service center uh, and maybe he will give you an, uh, this binary. So, uh, for most of our tests, we don't need a full dispenser assembly. Uh, when you want to play with protocol and other logical things, all you need is uh, uh, control the board itself, uh, USB, uh, cable, laptop or PC and power supply. So this slide shows us brief information about the firmware binary. Uh, first of all, it is not encrypted, uh, it is VXVOX based uh, and uh, also it has unstripped symbols. <laughs> it makes our analysis less difficult. Uh, to start with, m we must understand that uh, in our case, uh, the dispenser controller board is a USB device. So there is uh, some code that uh, receives commands, uh, distributes them uh, to lower levels and uh, sends some responses to, uh, to these commands. And to find this code, uh, we must uh, identify the CPU name on its chip and uh, then we must find the datasheet document and find some control register and data register constants in it. Then we will, uh, we will use this constants to find the uh, code. So uh, here are some of search results. As you can see, uh, there uh, here uh, there are write packet function and read packet function uh, that are very interesting for us, but uh, their names are mangled. It is not a problem. So uh, first uh, problem that you will face is absence of Motorola decompilers. Uh, 
Uh, also, there are many C++ virtual function tables and virtual calls. Uh, that was difficult to analyze in the x86 too. Uh, if you divide the code into main components, uh, you will get the following scheme. Uh, the first level is the thread that responsible for receiving and uh, distributing USB packets between services. Level 2 are services, basic execution units, and each of them has its own role and uh, its own tasks, also called classes. Level 3 uh, classes. Here there are tasks that are executable by different services using such things as their controllers. Uh, and the last level, controllers. They are logical. Uh, in fact, they are workers that uh, perform commands validation, execution, and answer forming. To execute an exact command, you must specify the service, the class, and the logical controller indices. Before that command will be executed, uh, by the execute function, it will be checked with the validate command function. Uh, and format response function forms the response packet with execution results. Dispenser transaction, transaction service is the most interesting service for us. It works with banknote withdraw commands and their encryption. This service has three classes, but only two of them are the most interesting. Class 1 uh, works with the secure messages and the second one was works with more secure messages uh, because they are encrypted. The only difference is that the class 1 uh, skips this, these more secure messages using the reject array uh, that contains command indices. Uh, my guess is uh, previously there was only one class in this code and uh, it looks like a fast fix rather than a good approach. So in this slide you see the sequence of actions that must be taken to generate the initial key uh, initialization. The first action is to select the encryption initialization command on the service operator screen. You will see it uh, later. Then you need to toggle the bottom cassette in the safe or to perform switching of the special tumbler on the controller board, all within one minute. Uh, after that, the dispenser uh, will send you the initial key. Encryption keys uh, have the rolling type. It means that every key uh, for every message will be different because of the rolling component, like a session number or message number. Uh, okay, now you think that it is possible to intercept uh, the packet with the initial key and use it then. No, it is uh, not possible. Because in the, in the handle initiate key exchange command, uh, the PC also sends the public key, which will be used for the encrypting the initial key. And uh, another part of command is the hardware ID which uh, must be must be equal to the real one just here <laughs> that makes uh, brute forcing of this command impossible unfortunately we don't have physical access to the safe where the dispenser controller is located so we cannot perform the initial key exchange it is only possible if the protection level uh, was set to the USB or to the logical one. Uh, to downgrade the protection level from the physical one, uh, you will also need to have the physical access to the safe. So, uh, what should we do? Uh, surely there is some way how the PC downloads the firmware uh, into the dispenser and S such thing can be called bootloader, and we must find it. Sometime later, I found the service that was responsible for switching to bootloader, and its name is USB Download Service. The only things that it does are switching into bootloader and sending a USB device information like a VAD, PID, and packet size. 
the most interesting fact is that uh, these commands uh, don't require to be encrypted. So uh, the bootloader itself has been hiding from me for a long time. Uh, its code uh, couldn't be just found by uh, string search or function name search. Uh, I have found it in the data section in the form of the glib stream. That's actually the secure word in its in its name is a fake because there is no any secure thing in it. This part of the research was the most difficult. We have reprogrammed the NVRAM chip a lot of times, thanks to Alexei. Uh, so, if you still decide to make a firmware download research, you must understand that without a NVRAM backup, uh, you have many chances to break your dispenser. So, what you need to do is to fix your firmware according to your intents. Uh, our intent was research, surely. <laughs> The first action is to switch into the bootloader. At this step, the special flag will be set in the, in the NVRAM and it will be checked later at the firmware boot. This flag was the cause of unbootable firmware during our attempts. The second action is to generate the uh, key pair for signature check that will be performed later. Uh, Self-signed firmware is a popular phenomenon, but uh, it is fully useless in our case because uh, it won't help you to protect the firmware if you are able to change the public key. Uh, so, uh, also you may specify the controller, serial number and the version of the firmware. At the third step, we need to send the reboot command. The dispenser bootloader will be booted again. Uh, the next action that we need to perform is, uh, is to send the data and text action sequentially, specifying physical addresses and sizes for every block in the packets header. There are some other problems too. Uh, you cannot just write a changed block. You must write the whole firmware sequentially. Also, you can specify virtual addresses here. Uh, you have to specify the physical ones. That's one. At this moment, we must already have the SHA-1 calculated for the uploaded bytes and encrypted with the private key of the key pair that was generated at previous steps. Also, we need to calculate the sum of the written half words of the firmware. At the fifth step, we must send the signed hash so the bootloader will check the data that was sent before. If, the, if signature validation fails, you will get brick again. And you cannot just send all bytes again at this moment because the last written address variable along with the written <coughs> word checksum were changed. The sixth step requires sending a calculated checksum and the physical address where the firmware bytes were downloaded. There were problems again <laughs> because I couldn't find each check for the physical address field and this led into uh, the bricked device again. Only after we have captured uh, the packet with this command, I understood that this field must contain the start physical address. And we made the second attempt. Finally, the current firmware was successfully downloaded. We, we were happy, sure. But could I download some old firmware with old vulnerabilities that were successfully used in some attacks before? A little bit later, I tried, I tried to do that. Then appeared some more problems. <laughs> First was uh, uh, the bootloader checks that the downloadable firmware would have the same or greater version number than in the current firmware. This check uh, can be skipped if no physical access is set, but it is not possible for us. But luckily, Vendor added the availability to upload any firmware binary if its version is equal to FFFF. Money withdrawal was still a problem. Encryption function was professionally implemented, so I decided to fix the secure command function so that it could allow it to execute any secure command without any encryption. To do that, uh, you just need to make 
uh, uh, instruction with uh, move zero to D zero register and then return instruction. To sum up, we have an ability not to use the cassette or tumbler switching. Uh, we can patch every byte in the firmware and now the protection level is not a problem. On the slide you can see the message uh, change toggle switch or bottom cassette state within one minute left and uh, right uh, dispenser protection configuration is physical. So the firmware was downloaded but it is not uh, as interesting as money withdrawal. Unfortunately, it is also a difficult task. Uh, just look at the graph of the function that checks the withdrawal packet's validity. That's it. Uh, surely with the decompiler it would have been easier. A stack controller is, uh, is that part of the code which makes bundles of banknotes, checks the hardware and many other mechanisms that can get stuck. It also checks if the ATM is tempered. It was difficult to analyze the stack controller without any peripherals. In fact, I didn't want to analyze the stack controller at all. One look at this function uh, was enough to close its code and never <laughs> return to it again. But after I analyzed all other needed functions, I had to return to stack controller again. The problem was not only in its code size. The captured traffic that contained this command was encrypted. Here I want to say a few words about the stack controller command itself. The first thing uh, you must specify is uh, cassette numbers uh, in which the banknotes are stored. Cassette numbers are virtual ones and they can be reassigned by other command. But in our case, uh, their numbers were equal to the real cassette's location. Uh, first, second, third and fourth. In the slide you see that I asked the first cassette to give us five, five banknotes. If the cassette doesn't have the required amount of, amount of banknotes, the dispenser will send you an error. After I worked out how the stack controller works, I decided to perform the first real withdrawal. I assembled the firmware with the fixed secure command function, which I have mentioned before, and downloaded the firmware into the dispenser and sent the stack controller's withdrawal command. In response, I received a message about a, a hardware error. There were many versions of why that could happen, ranging from a malfunction of the ATM to additional checks, which uh, I have not found. That day we didn't get any money. I was afraid also that the dispenser was completely broken by me. <laughs> so a bit later I found the clear main transport command and I decided to use it, just because its name looked interesting. This command is necessary for the money withdrawal process to clean, uh, clear and initialize uh, some related things. Unfortunately, no real packet was captured, so the only Python hex dump in this slide is presented. After we made the second withdrawal, uh, trying using the clear main transport command, we got the money. After a long and painful search, after a dozen times breaking controllers, we managed to make a withdrawal. As a result, we have succeeded to execute our code by passing the encryption, worked out stack controller principles to understand how the ATM cache withdrawal occurs, and have also learned how to initialize all the mechanics correctly. Let's see the demo. <laughs> it's not me. It's some crime person. <laughs> yeah. So that message about toggles of the cassette.
sorry for no sound, it's not very important. Uh, as you can see, there is no plastic uh, plate. plate there because uh, we have taken it for our tests. But in real situation, you have to do a uh, some drilled box, as Alexei told before. So protection level is physical, and let's start. We're ready to hug it. We That's take a USB hand. cable from dispenser and connect it to our laptop. We are going to bootloader mode, yeah. And you can see in, in bottom of this video uh, timing for this attack. At this moment, the video a little bit increased to waiting a little bit. But timer is real. So firmware was uploaded or downloaded. So now it's reboots to firmware to our new firmware fixed. Now I send a clear main transfer command. It usually performs only once uh, at the start of ATM. Uh, so uh, it takes a time to be finished. And now, cash withdrawal. Shutter was closed and then money was taken. Five banknotes, they are now real. It's uh, it, NCR's... Uh, NCR test banknotes. Yeah. And little so, promotion. <laughs> time was uh, 3.43. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. So, uh, after we assured ourselves that vulnerability uh, is really dangerous uh, and it tells us to execute arbitrary code and to issue money, uh, the report was sent to NCR last year in December and uh, research was done on the basis of S1 dispenser controller, but later it was confirmed for S2 dispenser also. The, pr the presence of vulnerabilities was confirmed and they were fixed in the, in the February security fixes. As you see, there are two CVE numbers for these vulnerabilities and uh, yeah. Also, NCR issued the white paper related to this uh, with recommendations for updating. So, these are our contacts. You may feel free to send us any questions. Thank you for listening and watching. Uh, now we are ready to answer your questions. Questions? Anyone? Hi. Uh, Hi. Were they, they happy to hear about this uh, from, from, from NCR's perspective? 
I'm oh, sorry, please repeat. Please uh, repeat. Were they, they happy to hear about this uh, problem or were they like, oh, this, should, this is a bad thing? It's really bad thing, but we will wait, wait for half a year to banks reach their updates. And then we are able to speak about it in public. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Anyone else with a question? Well, I guess um, oh, this is it. Thank you very much. And, uh, Thank you. Thank you.